as you heard in the last two presentations, uh, Doug Gaffins and Aaron Corbett's, I'm going to kind of combine some of their ideas into one study that um, a couple of students and I tackled. I taught animal behavior, and I offered a one uh, credit hour optional lab, but in that lab we were going to go out and do some research. And so I had three ambitious students who wanted to, from scratch, create a project um, from the ground up, from planning all the way through, and this is the project that we came up with. So venometering, as was mentioned before, is just this idea that um, venom is a, a metabolically and biologically costly commodity, and so therefore it should be judiciously used. And we've seen this in a number of different animals, snakes, spiders, scorpions, lots of different venomous animals tend to use their venom in this way. And we see that um, they will, depending on society level, control the amount of venom that they inject. Venom availability affects this prey size, struggle intensity of all of these parameters, including threat, as we've talked about with risk assessment, or Aaron talked about last time. Um, some of the things that we don't know, of course, this is an incomplete list of knowns, and then in the unknown realm, we really haven't delved into, well, what about those signals, or what, which, uh, what components, um, what kinds of sensory modalities are these animals using to make decisions about spending venom or not? And so that's kind of a direction that we want to head in our lab, and we're extending it to include that defensive silk because it can be thought of in an analogous way. And as Doug mentioned, and really this research wouldn't have been possible without Doug because he was very gracious in, in sharing his MATLAB script so that we could analyze the movements of our scorpions, as you'll see in a little bit. Um, but he's laid the foundation for uh, um, understanding some of the scorpion navigation and suggesting, uh, as he did previously, that scorpions have the ability to possibly, or at least they have all of the necessary features for path integration and learning loss. And so we wanted to take these ideas and kind of merge them together and ask the question, um, if we allow a scorpion to explore its environment overnight and we manipulate in some way that environment, Will they learn about it, and will that learned um, information, or will that information affect their willingness to engage in defensive behaviors like stinging? And we're not gonna directly, in this particular study, measure venom uh, use. Um, we're building towards that, but we're gonna use stinging as a proxy for that. So, the, more specifically, the kinds of questions we're asking is about risk assessment. Do we see risk assessment in this particular species? I don't, I'm not aware of any literature that suggested that uh, Vegevis uh, has been tested for risk assessment, so we we're going to on a baseline test that. Um, and how we tested that was going to be, we're going to poke them, as you saw I like to poke things. Um, we're going to poke them in, in three different locations um, for the, using non-technical terms, the easiest things to understand. We're going to poke them on the claw, poke them on the tail, and poke them on the body behind the eyes. And we're I bought, or predicting that uh, Pokes to the body are going to be the most threatening because if they were to have a damage there, um, it's probably more severe than the other two locations. Next, we've got lots of evidence in the literature to suggest that there are sex differences both in this species and in venom use behavior across other uh, uh, scorpion species. So we wanted to see are we seeing that again here in the defensive behaviors and in their movement patterns. And then, as we did, we varied the number of hides within the arenas we put them in. We either put them in a, an arena with no hides available, just substrate, or we put them with two hides or four hides, and we left them overnight. So that, uh, in red, I, I put um, this exploration. I'll explain what exploration is, um, but I'm not going to present any of that data here. Uh, we were working like crazy to get everything done and, and finish all the MATLAB uh, video analysis. Uh, we did that, but then when I got here and we're trying to merge the files together, there was a problem I got to fix, but I need my computer back at the office to do that. So that'll be a story for another time. So back to the methods. Um, we had nine males and nine females. Uh, we did a repeated measures design, so once per week they were put in an arena. The arenas had varying numbers of hides, zero, two, or four. Um, we then left them to move overnight. We kept the light-dark cycle the same as the uh, period of time for that, or that part of the year, which was, this is around November, December, when we did this experiment. Um, and so the length of, of light and, and dark were the same. We observed them and recorded their overnight movements, so roughly 14 hours with some light on either side. And then we tested them behaviorally the next morning by poking them two minute uh, observation period, 
um, or until if they ran under a high event stock to trial. And then they were poked once per second on these three different locations in succession. Um, so 10 claw touches, 10 tail touches, 10 body touches, repeat, repeat, repeat through two minutes. Okay, so um, the exploration variable. So this is an example of what you get out uh, if you were to graph the uh, CSV files that you get from the MATLAB script. Um, and what we did to calculate exploration, you'll notice that the scorpions, if you were to watch this, they would be going around in circles a lot. The arenas are circular. They like to move around the out exterior of the arena. Um, they just keep on going, but that movement on the outside isn't so informative because the hides are on the inside. And so we wanted to say, or figure out how much of the total movement that they're doing, how much of their movement is in the center. And so we um, found the center of the circle and then calculated 75% from out of that. And the, within that 75% is their movement within the center or proportion of movement in the center. And that's our exploration variable. Okay, results. So for risk assessment, I put these results in order of what I would feel is strength of uh, or robustness of the findings. So risk assessment, I, we thought we were going to find risk assessment. That's one of the major reasons why we put it in there, because I wanted to find something. I was kind of taking a, a leap of uh, faith here about uh, whether this was going to have any impact at all. But with some undergraduate projects, that's OK. We don't have to find positive results. We can find whatever we find. But with risk assessment, we're reasonably sure. And sure enough, we, we did find strong evidence for risk assessment. So the frequency of stings by location of touch, if you touch them on the body, they're way more likely to try to sting the probe than if you touch them either on the tail or the claws. In fact, they're almost two and a half times more likely to sting um, when you touch them on the body. Uh, when you, the least is the tail, and even there, it's about half as likely, the reference category is the claw, so um, the tail is about half as likely to receive or to deliver a sting when you touch them there versus the claw. So both of those were significant. Uh, frequency of pinching. So we thought maybe we didn't know much about their use of claws for defense here. Um, and so um, we included this. Uh, we found that there's really no difference between body and claw. They're about, uh, um, when you touch them in either of those two locations, there is likely, it's not a very common behavior, so it doesn't seem like that's a normal defensive strategy, but they will not do it at all when you touch them on the tail. They never try to turn around. Their biggest response there is going to be moving away from the stimulus. Um, when you touch them on the body or the tail, they're about the same likelihood of, of running. They spend about the same amount of time running. This is duration of run by location of touch. Um, compared to the claw, they're not as likely to try to run away. Um, in fact, the difference between body and claw and tail and claw is about four and a half seconds greater a time spent running than um, on, on a claw touch. Um, so you can see that total duration of run over two minutes, they're not really running that much. They're running in these short bursts, um, but they're spending a lot of time just kind of sitting there and, and, and taking the touches and then trying to sting. They do an awful lot of stinging. Okay, so moving on uh, from risk assessment into sex differences. Here we have our first interaction. Um, this is frequency of sting. Um, is our dependent variable and location of touch and sex is our, so this is a location by sex interaction. And, and we see that males and females are behaving differently from each other. So when you touch them on the body, females are way more likely than males to deliver stings. Um, that difference tends to go away or maybe is reversed uh, in the other two locations. Um, and there might be some uh, ecological reasons for that, um, but I'll save that for another slide. Um, next is movement. Um, so this is uh, average amount of movement per frame, so a normalized movement. This is just a measure of how much, how vigorously or how much movement they were doing. And then number of hides by sex. Okay, so sex by available hides in terms of predicting movement. Um, you'll notice that in the number of hides I have three, one, and zero, instead of before I had mentioned that there were either zero, two, or four hides. So um, in planning the experiment, we thought what would happen if we come back the next morning and the scorpion is under a hide? Well, we're going to have to remove that hide, right? 
So that's why we did two hides in, in the medium category, because we could remove one, whichever one the scorpion, scorpion was closest to, either the one it was up under or the closest proximity, and it would still have another available hide to run to um, uh, as they move through their environment. Okay? And what we're seeing here is a significant interaction that, again, um, females seem to be, uh, when there are more hides available, especially in the highest category, they are moving less. And we notice that that matches well with the amount of exploration. So not only are they moving less overall when there are more hides available, but they're spending a larger proportion of time in the center of the arena, a more larger proportion of their movements is in the center. Uh, and what we found was um, they're moving less overall, and so they're, they're getting to the center, finding hides, and then kind of staying put more than the males are. The males are doing more total movements, and they're not as affected by the number of hides available. Um, and then independent of sex, we still see this same trend that as number of hides increase, the amount of time spent in the center of the, or the proportion of movement in the center is greater, independent of sex. Okay, so the last is, do we see more evidence that hides are affecting their defensive behaviors? Um, we've got two more results slides. This one is uh, number of hides by location of touch interaction and the frequency of sting. And again, we see that um, for when they're likely to sting, we see a decrease in their uh, use of stinging behavior as you have an increase in the number of hides. So more hides available, less likely to sting. This matched our prediction, which was if there's a hide and they know about a hide, they're probably going to want to try to move towards that hide instead of standing and fighting. And we see some evidence to suggest that's true. Um, and then we don't see that relationship um, in the other two locations. And then the mother of all interactions, this is sex by location, by number of hide interaction, freeway interaction. Um, and what we're seeing here is that, again, we see those sex differences. Females are much more likely to sting than males are when you touch them on the body. But even in those situations, um, we still see that as hides increase, there's a general decrease in the number of stings. Um, but that kind of goes away for the males. The males tended to sting a little bit more than females when there are uh, fewer hides in the other two locations. So it might be, we might be seeing preliminary evidence that, you know, that tail is really important for the male in terms of, uh, they have to have their venom, they probably are using their venom for sexual courtship, um, they need their claws because they have to grasp the female's claws and position her over the spermatophore, so maybe they're assessing that front differently than the females are. That's way too preliminary to write a book about, so that's why this is the last of the results slide, because it's the weakest, I think, of all of our uh, results. So conclusions, uh, what can we safely conclude and where, what might we tentatively say? Well, I think our strongest conclusion is that scorpions, we again see them uh, assessing threats and modulating their behavior, especially their behavior associated with venom use, such as stinging, in response to that threat. Um, males and females, again, we see differences in how they behave, both in terms of their movement patterns. Females are moving less, and they're spending more time in the center, so when they find hives, they might explore a little bit in the center, but they're staying in the center and, and not moving as much overall, and males are exploring more. Um, and that kind of matches what we know about this particular species. And then most tentatively of all would be, what are hides doing? Are they learning something about their environment? as they move through it. Well, we've got some suggestions that yes, they might be doing that, but I think we need some more careful study here to really kind of elucidate what's truly going on and uh, rule out chance. So with that, uh, that's kind of our future directions. We want to continue to make this more robust, include actual venom collection to look at the amount of venom delivered during stings. Um, which has been worked out by Van der Meijen, and we're going to try to apply his technique with a student this year. Um, and so that's where we're going to be going next with this particular project. Thank you.
we are going to be testing vision first um, because it's easier to, sorry, I should be using this. It's easier to um, modify vision. Uh, we could put them on, I mean, you have a paper on what light wavelengths they can see. So we're planning on putting them under red light, infrared light, and then some of the green light and things that they should be able to see well, and then re redoing this to see what vision, oral vision is playing. That's one of our next experiments. Thank you.